Good evening. Thank you to our medical students for that song. These are the future doctors here in Iloilo. And thank you for Dr. Dr. De La Cruz for joining us here tonight. I remember seeing a cartoon one time of a some little tiny animal was talking to this big gorilla. And the gorilla had something leafy in his mouth. And he says, he says, vegetarian? I'm talking to the gorilla. I said, vegetarian? Where do you get your protein? Where does the gorilla get his protein? <laughs> By the way, Dr. Dela Cruz told you he's 52. He's two years older than I am. Now you know how old I am. <laughs> Welcome tonight to Mysteries of Bible Prophecy. If you've tuned in to 101.9, we welcome you. Those of you that are here who have family or friends that can't come, then encourage them to tune in every evening at about 6.30 for our Mysteries of Prophecy, first the health part, then the Prophecy Seminar. We're going to begin with a thank you for those of you given offerings for our seminar expenses. We appreciate your free will gifts. Let's now do our quiz. Anybody need a quiz card? You need a quiz card, raise your hand. We have helpers that will pass one to you. This is from our meeting on Saturday night. The Mysteries of the Mummies. Question number one, you need to write in the answer. Is the soul mortal or immortal? Is the soul mortal or immortal? Write your answer on your first line there on your quiz card. Just put down either mortal or immortal for the answer. Number two, the live, true or false, the living soul is simply a combination of the body with the breath of life. Is that true or false? The living soul is simply a combination of the body with the breath of life. Number three is a question. According to Scripture, how much do the dead know? According to Scripture, how much do the dead know? Right in an answer there on line three. Number four, true or false, according to Jesus, the dead are sleeping in the grave, awaiting the resurrection. According to Jesus, the dead are sleeping in the grave, awaiting the resurrection. Is that true or false? Final question. Is it yes or no? Did the Egyptians have the truth concerning what happens to a person when they die? Did the Egyptians have the truth concerning what happens to a person when they die? You remember, may remember the Egyptians, they spent all this effort and work to mummify their dead for their reasons, which we shared. Did they have the truth about what happens when you die? Let's go back and review and see how well we did. You can grade yourself. Question number one, is the soul mortal or immortal? The soul, if we found out, is mortal. That might have been a new revelation for some of us here. Number two, is true or false? The living soul is simply a combination of the body with the breath of life. What's the answer? That's true. Question three, according to Scripture, how much do the dead know? The dead know not anything. So if you put nothing or zero, something like that, then you got the correct answer. Number four, according to Jesus, the dead are sleeping in the grave awaiting the resurrection. What's the answer? That's true. And five, did the Egyptians have the truth concerning what happens to a person when they die? No, they didn't. They thought that when you die, you live on, like so many do today. And that's why the Egyptians mummified their dead. How many of you got 100% on your quiz? All right, looks like most of you did, or at least most of you that are taking the quiz. We're going to sing this hymn as they pass the baskets. You can drop in your quiz card with your score, your questions, if you have questions or prayer requests. While they pass the baskets, they will sing this song, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. If you know the song, sing with me. Hymn 516. Oh. 
All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When I wake to life immortal, wing my flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. I hope that is your song tonight. You probably know that this is the 15th meeting. At least those of you that have been taking count, swiping your barcode so that you can get your free Bible. If you have, How many have been here from the very beginning? Let me see your hands. All right, quite a few of you. Well, if you have not missed a meeting, then tonight is number 15 of our Mysteries of Prophecy seminar. You can keep... Your Bible tonight, if you've been to every meeting. Now, if you missed a meeting, well, you keep coming. Keep swiping your barcode. When you get to number 15, then you'll be able to keep your Bible. Those of you that take a Bible home because you've been here to 15 meetings, bring it back tomorrow. You'll need the Bible. It's your Bible. You can put your name in it after you've qualified to keep it, but you'll want to bring it every night because we use the Bible here. We still have some of the Great Hope book. If you want to buy it, you won't get a better price than right here. And as I mentioned earlier, we have some students that are working with us. These are not medical students. These are Bible students. And one of the things they've learned is selling books. And they've been out on the streets selling. Well, one of the books they've been selling is this book. But they sold it for a little more than we're selling it here. And if you bought the book from a student... For a higher price, that's okay, because you're helping them to pay for their tuition, for their Bible college. So, but anyway, here, if you buy the book here, and if you bought one already, you can buy a second and give it to your friends or your family. And we have DVDs also from our meeting recordings. If you'd like to get a DVD of the previous lectures. How many of you have already done your homework for Thursday? Anybody done your homework? Maybe not yet. Well, you still have time. Your homework is to read Revelation chapter 20 or reread that. That's for Thursday's topic. What's coming up tomorrow night is the hottest topic in the Bible. Hellfire. The mystery of hellfire. Is it burning already? If so, where? We'll talk about that tomorrow. Then Wednesday, there's no meeting. Night off. Thursday, our topic is Revelation's Millennium, when the devil goes on vacation. Do your homework. We will study the entire chapter of Revelation 20 for Thursday. Let's stand now. Oh, one more. I guess I had one more uh, day listed here. Friday, Mystery 666. I'll show you the origin of 666 this coming Friday. Let's stand. And sing our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange. In the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts and our thoughts to you in this moment of prayer. Asking for your presence in our hearts, first of all, and here in this place. 
and praying that you would teach us the truth as we open the Holy Bible. We want to keep the devil's door closed, so tonight show us what that is and how to keep it closed in each of our hearts and lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Our topic for tonight, the devil's mysterious door. Knock, knock. It was the weekend of March 22, 23, 1997, when 39 members of the Heaven's Gate cult joined in a mass suicide, the largest suicide in American history. They believed that through death, they would go on to a higher level of existence. In fact, one person said this about them. This is J. Gordon Melton, the editor of the authoritative Encyclopedia of American Religion, Religions, describing this cult. He said, quote, In this case, they had a positive motive, a great place to go, he says. So why hang around here? End of quote. A great place to go? Where did they go? Another person said this, this is James Tabor. He, was, he is a cult expert at the University of North Carolina. He said this about the Heaven's Gate cult. This group is completely different. These people rather calmly followed suicide as their exit in a very positive way to a higher level of existence. That's what he says, a higher level of existence. They define death not as the enemy of life, but as life itself. End of quote. Question. Is death life or is death death? It's a fair question. What happens to a person when they die? Is death the entrance to the next level? Is death the beginning of another life in another form in another place? Is death a friend or is it an enemy? Now you understand the Heaven's Gate cult, they believed that death was a friend because it would free the soul from its prison. They called it the container of the body. So through death, you know, the soul would be free to go off to the next level of existence. That's why they killed themselves. Is death a friend or an enemy? What's the Bible say? Let's read the answer from 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Those of you taking notes, this is our first text tonight, so you can mark that if you like. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26. Read with me, please. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is, is death. Death is a friend or an enemy. What is it? The Bible says death is a, is a what? Is an enemy. Well, obviously the Heaven's Gate cult didn't believe the Bible. Because they felt that death was the friend liberating the soul. In fact, going back to the statement, they, the Heaven's Gate cult, define death not as the enemy of life, but as life itself. Why did the Heaven's Gate cult commit suicide? I'll tell you why. Because they had opened the devil's door. Instead of the heaven's gate, it turned out to be the devil's door. What is the devil's door? Virtually all the cults have opened the devil's door. Most world religions have opened the devil's door. Many people have opened the devil's door. And even some Christians have opened the devil's door. What is the devil's door? Well, before we answer that question... Let's answer another question, which will be helpful for us in understanding what the devil's door is. And that's the question, how do you identify a cult? Since virtually all the cults have opened the devil's door, it will be helpful for us in understanding what that door is to first understand how to identify a cult. What is it about the cults that makes them so vulnerable to the devil? Why is it that virtually all cults open the devil's door? We have seen in our world some amazing cults. Back in the 70s, there was the Jonestown cult. Over 900 died in a mass suicide. Somebody estimate there's some 5,000 cults in America alone. So it's important for us to know how to identify a cult. What is a cult? Well, from a Christian perspective, a cult is any group that does not accept Christ as Lord and Savior and the Bible as the foundation of faith. We'll see that in our study this evening. Let's list four ways to identify a cult. And if you're taking notes, I don't actually have a handout that goes with this, so you can mark down these four ways. 
We had a handout for tonight, but somehow it didn't get produced, so we'll have it for you tomorrow night. But these four ways to identify a cult, you'll need to have somewhere in your notes, because I don't have them in handout form so far. Number one, cults follow a human leader rather than Jesus. Number one, cults follow a human leader rather than Jesus. And the Heaven's Gate cult was a good example of that. They were following Marshall Applewhite. He was their leader. Happened to be a former choir director. And he led them into committing suicide. He was a charismatic teacher, charismatic leader. Cults follow a human leader rather than Jesus. As Christians, who should we follow? We should follow Jesus. Jesus says, John 14, verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you want the safe way, follow Jesus. It's safe to follow Jesus. It's not safe to follow a man. Don't follow me. I make mistakes. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you. She'll assure you. Follow Jesus. In fact, the Bible tells us that the sheep follow Jesus. Let's read that from John chapter 10. This is the chapter of the Good Shepherd. John 10, verse 4. We have the page there if you're using the Seminar Bible. John 10, verse 4 says, have you found that? Yes? <laughs> Some of you. If you're there, say amen. That's still kind of weak. John 10, verse 4. I would encourage you to look these up in your Bible. What you'll find as you look up the text in your Bible or the Bible you're using here, you'll become more familiar with the Bible. And I have many people tell me at the end of my seminars, they say, Pastor, I've become so familiar with the Bible, they don't even need the pages anymore. So I would encourage you to look up those texts, open your Bible, and follow with us. You'll become familiar with God's Word. John 10, verse 4, Jesus says, When he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep, what do they do? They follow him, for they know his voice. Here's my question for you tonight. Who are you following? I hope you're following Jesus. It's safe to follow Jesus. It's not safe to follow a man. Cults follow a human leader rather than Jesus. And are there Christians that make that same mistake? It's amazing to me as I do these prophecy seminars. I've been conducting these for 19 years now around the globe. And when people come, they learn things that they never knew before. And some people, they say, well, if God's word says it, I'll do it. I believe it. Other people say, yeah, I know that's what the Bible says, but I'm going to go ask my pastor what he thinks. Well, who are they following then? Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not wrong to ask pastors. I, as a pastor, I have people ask me all the time questions about the Bible and so forth. But you should not follow your pastor any farther than you can be sure that he's following Jesus and following the Bible. Don't even follow pastors. Not even this pastor. Follow Jesus. In fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 5, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. And maketh flesh his arm. If you're putting your confidence in some man, there's a curse waiting for you. Put your confidence in God. God will never disappoint you. Jesus will never let you down. Pastors will sometimes. Maybe too often. But not Jesus. Cults follow a human leader rather than Jesus. Moving on now to our second way to identify a cult. Number two. Cults follow human teachings rather than the Bible. Cults follow human teachings and traditions rather than the Bible. As Christians, we should follow the living word, Jesus, and the written word, the, the Bible. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 17, 17, Thy word is the truth. If you want the truth, you find it in God's word. And then you can read in Psalms 119, verse 105, Thy word is a, a what? A lamp unto my feet and a... And a light to my path. Why do we need a light to lighten our path? So that we don't fall into some cult trap. 
God gave us his word. Cults follow human teachings rather than the Bible. And the Heaven's Gate cult provides a classic example of that. You're looking at a photograph here in the picture of the Heaven's Gate cult classroom. This is where the 38 followers of Marshall Applewhite would sit. And Marshall would sit, seat himself up in a seat up on these two tables. They put these two tables, they fastened them together, and he had, he had his seat up there where he would sit and teach his followers. But if you look at the picture, you'll notice there are two chairs up on the tables. Marshall Applewhite sat in one of them. Can you guess who sat in the other one? The ghost of his deceased girlfriend. That's a fact. Marshall Applewhite left his wife, ran off with this other woman. Together they started a cult, Heaven's Gate cult. She later died of cancer because she wasn't following health expo principles. Like doctors have been teaching us. <laughs> died of cancer. And after her death, Marshall Applewhite, he would always place an empty chair beside him where the ghost of his deceased girlfriend would sit and assist him in teaching. Wouldn't you have loved to sit in those classes and listen to the words of the guru himself along with the ghost of his girlfriend? I could share with you some of the stuff they taught. It's absurd, some of the things that they taught. But among the things that they taught, they, they read from the Bible. I was amazed when I discovered that. But they sure weren't following it. They were following the teachings of a man. Cults follow human teachings rather than the Bible. Now I have a question. Are there Christians that are doing that too? Following human teachings, human traditions instead of the word of God? Oh yes, there are many Christians, many churches that are doing that. And you probably are beginning to realize that if, as you've been coming night by night. You've been opening your, the Bible and seeing for yourself. Most Christians, for example, they know there are Ten Commandments in the Ten Commandments. And they come up with all these human reasons why you only have to keep nine of the Ten Commandments. I won't go there. You've heard that already. Cults follow human teachings rather than the Bible. As Christians, we should follow God's Word. Let's go to number three. Four ways to identify a cult. Number three, cults urge group conformity. Number three, cults urge group conformity. The Heaven's Gate cult is a good example. Here's a picture of the members. When they died, before they died, they actually prepared a video explaining their lethal plans, how they were planning to commit suicide. And those who watched the video that they prepared, they said you could hardly tell who was who. They were all dressed alike. They all dressed up in these baggy black pants, flowing black shirts. They had brand new black Nike tennis shoes. They all cut their hair short. And as you looked at the video that they prepared before they committed suicide, you could hardly tell who was young, who was old, who was man, who was woman. They all looked the same. Almost the same. Group conformity. Are there Christians that make that same mistake? They don't think they're in a cult, but they follow what everybody else is doing. Are there Christians that do that, make that mistake? Yes. They have the idea, if everybody else is doing it, it must be right. I have had people ask me, Pastor, are you telling me that the whole world is wrong? If everybody's doing it, surely it must be okay. I've learned one thing in my short life. Uh, I told you how old I am. At least you figured it out. But that's, that's really not that old. And I've learned one thing, if everybody else is doing it, I can almost guarantee it's wrong. Because the majority are never right. The issue is peer pressure. The devil uses peer pressure to keep us from obeying the word of God. The pressure of our friends, the pressure of our family. We know what God's word says, but because of these, all these pressures, we don't obey God's word. The issue is mind control. The devil knows if he can control the mind of the leaders, he can control the masses. God has given you, friend, the freedom of choice, free will. And you should not allow any person, be it a friend or a relative, to manipulate your free will. If God says it, let's do it. Amen? Somebody says, if God says it, I believe it, that settles it. 
a simple theology. But that, that would really help us to follow God if we followed that theology. God says it. I accept it. I will obey. Think about Daniel's friends. You may have heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were called with other leaders of the kingdom of Babylon to the great plain of Dura. I don't know how big the plain was or how many people were there, but everybody that was there that had any position in the entire realm of Babylon, there probably were thousands there. It might have been 100,000 or more. And the king said, when the music plays, here's this idol, this golden idol. You bow down. You talk about peer pressure. The music played, all those thousands of people bowed, and there were three men. They withstood the peer pressure, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, we will die before we'll disobey God. We'll stand even if we have to stand all alone. Where do you find that kind of commitment today? Are you willing to stand for the truth even if you end up standing by yourself? Cults urge group conformity. Proverbs says this, Proverbs 16, 25, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. It seems right because we've always done it this way. It seems right because everybody else is doing it this way. It seems right because all my family do it this way. But what's the Bible say? Where is it going to go? The end thereof is what? It's the ways of death. It seems right. But it's headed in the wrong direction. Think about Noah. In Noah's day, there were, were the majority right or wrong? What do you think the majority of people in Noah's day had to say about Noah? They probably said, he's a great, he's a fanatic. He's a, he's a sectarian. He's starting some sect. He's starting some cult. A boat cult. Stay away from Noah, that boat cult. Let me ask you this, was Noah a cult leader? No, Noah was simply following the instructions of God, the word of God. It's amazing to me how when people learn the truths of God's word and they make a decision to follow them, how often family or friends, oh, be careful, you might be getting into some cult or some sect if you, if you do that. Mark this, it's not cultish to obey God. It's not sectish to obey God. If you're following the word of God and the commandment of God, then you, regardless of what people might call you, you know you're following the right, the truth. If you had followed the crowd in Noah's day, what would have happened to you? What happened to the crowd in Noah's day? <laughs> they drowned in the flood, and if you'd followed the crowd, you would have been among those that drowned. How many people were in the ark? Only eight people. That was a minority, but I would have wanted to be in that minority, wouldn't you? Inside the ark. And so cults urge group conformity. Mark this point. You cannot follow the truth and follow the crowd too. You have to choose between one or the other. It's either the crowd, the masses do what they're doing, or it's the truth. What God says to do, you have to pick. You cannot follow the truth and follow the crowd. I want to follow the truth, amen? Let me try that again. I want to follow the truth. How about you? Make God's word your guide. Let's go to the fifth or the fourth way to identify a cult. Number four, cults are deceived on the state of man in death. And I would say of all the identifying marks for a cult, this one is the most obvious. Cults are deceived on the state of man and death. New Age cults repeat the age-old lie. There is no death. Man is God. Knowledge of, salvation, of self is salvation. And it is on this point of deception concerning death that the cults open the devil's door. We'll see that tonight. Here again is the statement from James Tabor. They, that's the Heaven's Gate cult, this group, is completely different. These people rather calmly followed suicide as their exit in a positive way to a higher level of existence. They define death not as the enemy of life, but as life itself. Isn't that confusion about death? When you define death as life, then that's confusion about death. Cults are deceived in the state of man and death. 
When you think when you die, you live on, that's deception. The cults believe that when you die, you don't really die. Are there Christians that also believe that? When you die, you don't really die. The destinations are different. The, you know, the cults, they say, when you die, the Heaven's Gate cult, they thought when they would die, they would go up into this UFO that they thought were, was flying behind the Hale-Bob Comet. That's where they were going, off in the cosmos somewhere. Christians say when you die, if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go down to the hot place. The destinations are different, but the belief is the same. When you die, you don't really die. It is this belief that when you die, you don't really die that actually is the latch for the devil's door. We'll see that tonight. The Heaven's Gate cult were channeling spirit guides for direction. Can it be dangerous to channel spirit guides? This, we're going to find out tonight, is indeed the devil's door. Channeling spirit guides. Who are the voices that speak to us from beyond the grave? Are they friendly voices? Or are they dangerous voices? Who are the spirits of spiritualism? And another question. Can it be dangerous to converse with the spirits of the dead? Should we open that door? What does the Bible have to say about the spirits of the dead? Well, for an example, take your Bible tonight and turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah 8, we're going to read verse 19 and 20. This is near the middle of the Bible. Isaiah 8. You have the page, the Old Testament page there on the screen. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. We'll start with verse 19. Isaiah 8, 19. If you're there, say yes. Okay, let's read verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, that's those who talk with the dead, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? Isaiah is saying, why should the living go to the dead for knowledge, for encouragement, for counsel? Isn't there a living God that we can go to? And then verse 20, he says, Isaiah says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to what? This word, it is because there is no light in them. What does the Word of God have to say about the spirits of the dead? Well, we've kind of answered that a little bit last meeting. Let's review a bit of what we learned. Ecclesiastes 9.5 said, read with me, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Which brings us to the question, Do the spirits of the dead return to visit the living? Well, let's review another text. This one is from Job. Job 7, verses 9 and 10. If you don't have that in your notes, then put it down tonight. Job 7, 9 and 10 says, As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. Not coming back from the grave. Reading on, it says, He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Based on God's word, now we can answer the question, do the spirits of the dead return to visit the living? What's the answer? The answer is no. I remember a lady told me one time, she said, Pastor, the spirit of my husband, who died last year, he comes to visit me every week. Once a week, my husband comes back. What's the Bible say? The Bible says the spirits of the dead do not come back to visit the living. He's not coming back to his house, the Bible said. Let me give you another text. Job 14, 12 says, So man lies down and riseth not. That's what we read back in Job 7. But here, Job clarifies. Till, till when? Till the heavens be no more. When's that? Well, if you'd like some cross-references, you can put in your notes. 2 Peter 3, 10. Revelation 6, 14, when the heavens be no more, that's when Jesus comes back. So when a person dies, so man lies down and riseth not, he's not coming back till, till the heavens be no more. In other words, when Jesus comes back, that's when they'll be resurrected. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So biblically, according to the Bible, the spirits of the dead do not return to visit the living. 
Here's another text if you'd like some more evidence. Job 16.22, Job says, When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. So Job says, when I die, I'm not coming back. Not coming back to visit the living. The Bible said, read with me, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Since the Bible is true. Since the dead do not come back to visit the living, since the dead don't know anything, then who is coming to visit us, claiming to be the spirits of our departed loved ones? That's a good question. Who wants to deceive people when they're at their lowest, you know, when, you lo when, when somebody dies, somebody you love dies, that's traumatic. I remember when my, my mother died. You feel kind of low emotionally and you're drained physically. You can't sleep at night because of the loss of... Who hits us when we are weak? Isn't it just like the devil to do that? To hit us when we're weak? Who was it that deceived the Heaven's Gate cult into committing the largest suicide in American history? It was the devil. There's an interesting verse that I'd like for you to read with me from the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And we're going to begin to see who it is that's coming back to visit us, claiming to be our departed loved ones. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. This is back in the New Testament. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. And if you're using the Seminar Bible, the, the page, pages start over when you get in the New Testament. So you have page 1 to whatever it is, Old Testament. And then New Testament starts. It starts all over with page 1 and then on to the end of the New Testament. So we're in the New Testament here. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. The Bible says, And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed into what? Into an angel of light. Since the devil can transform himself into an angel of light, do you think he can transform himself into the appearance of one of our dead loved ones? Or do you think one of his demons could do something like that? Let me tell you a story. I had a, my, my friend Joe Cruz, the founder of Amazing Facts, told me this story. He said there was a missionary family years ago working in Africa. And they had a precious little girl that was the pride and joy of their life. But while they were serving in Africa, their little girl got sick with a tropical disease. And she eventually died. And those heartbroken missionary parents, they had to bury their little, little girl in Africa. They couldn't afford to return to their homeland for the funeral. They buried their daughter in Africa. Two weeks after the funeral, the mother was sitting in the kitchen one morning. She was still grieving over the loss of this little girl. When suddenly the door burst open and in ran the little girl. She said, Mama, Mama, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. Every one of the mother's emotions and senses told her, this is your girl. Looks just exactly like her little girl. Dressed like her, talked like her. It was everything. It was a perfect picture of a little girl. And all of her emotions, she just wanted to gather that little girl up into her arms and hug her. She missed her daughter so much. But that mother knew the Bible. She knew the Bible says the dead don't know anything. She knew the Bible says the dead do not return to their homes. And so she said to that little girl, looked exactly like her daughter. She said to that little girl, she said, in the name of Jesus Christ, depart from this house. And she said, before my very eyes, that little girl turned into a demon. And then disappeared. The devil is seeking to deceive people. The Bible tells us, Revelation 16, 14, for they are the spirits of devils doing what? Working miracles. If we don't have the Bible as our guide, we will be deceived by the devil's delusions. So cults are deceived on the state of man and death. And unfortunately, there are some Christians that are also deceived on the state of man and death. In America, eight Million Americans claim to have had a near-death experience. And they think because of these near-death experiences that it's the truth. When you die, you don't really die. There's a part that lives on because I left my body. People tell me, you know, I had this near-death experience. I died, clinically died, went up into this tunnel of light, and I met this shining being that said, oh, it's not your time to die. You need to go back and live again. They had the experience. 
But we know, of course, the dead know how much. So they weren't dead. They might have had a near-death experience, but they weren't dead. Did you know Marshall Applewhite, the founder of the Heaven's Gate cult, had a near-death experience? He was in the hospital for a heart procedure, had a near-death experience, survived. He ran off with one of the nurses of the hospital. Together, they had an affair, and they started the Heaven's Gate cult. Got started out of a near-death experience. What happens to a person when they die? Well, we answered that in our last study. But let's review, though, this evening. We've learned that man, mankind, is mortal. We also discovered that the soul is mortal. In fact, let's review that from the Bible, Ezekiel 18, verse 4, where the Bible says, read with me, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So evidently the soul is not immortal because the Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We learned in our last meeting that our hope after death is what? Is the resurrection when Jesus returns. Let's review again the text from John 5, 28 and 9. If you missed that, you can write that in your notes tonight. John 5, 28 and 9. Jesus says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are where? In the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Come forth from where? Not from hell, not from purgatory, not from heaven. They'll come forth from the grave when they hear his voice. They shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two resurrections. We're going to study those, by the way, on Thursday when we talk about the thousand years. Here's something that's interesting. The very first lie the devil ever told mankind was on the topic of death. Since that was his first lie, do you suppose it may be one of his last lies also? Probably so. Let's go back and look at that first lie ever told mankind. Genesis chapter 2, or 3 rather, it's page 2, or maybe it's page 3, I don't know. It says page 3 on the screen, so we'll trust that that's what it is. Genesis 3, this is the Old Testament. I didn't put Old Testament there, it's just page 3, but it's Old Testament. In the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. Genesis 3, let's begin with verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? By the way, did Eve know that she was talking to the devil when she was talking to the serpent? If you saw a talking snake in the, in, in the tree, the mango tree, would you stop to listen? Probably not. Not with all we've been through in this world of sin. But Eve, she'd never had fear of anything. And then here's a talking serpent in the tree. And back in those days, the serpent was a dazzling creature, had wings, flew through the air. So she stopped to listen. Eve did not know she was talking to the devil. And I'm going to show you in a moment how there are some Christians that are talking with demons and don't realize it. Reading on, verse 2 says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the, fr of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. By the way, did Eve know what death was like? Had Eve ever seen anything die? Never had. She had no idea what death was. It was just something that God had said, If you eat, you'll die. She didn't know what death was, but that's what God said. So she says, God told us if we eat, we're going to die. Verse 4, here's the first lie ever told mankind. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. It might seem like death, but you're going to live on. You know why people are afraid to go out into a graveyard on a dark, moonless, windy night long about Halloween? Because everybody knows those people out there in the tombs, they're dead, but they're not surely dead. So they're afraid. The devil told Eve, you shall not surely die. In fact, notice reading on verse 5 says, 
For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You're not going to die, Eve. Instead of death, you're going to go on to a higher level of existence. Isn't that what the Heaven's Gate call was trying to do? They thought that through death, they would go to a higher level. And the devil is telling Eve, you're not going to die. Instead of death, you'll go to a higher level. Think about this. If at death, the soul of the saved goes to heaven, then haven't they gone to a higher level of existence? Yes or no? Yes, they have. If the soul goes to heaven when you die, if you're good, then you've gone to a higher level of existence. And if that's true, we might well covet death. Can you see the deception? It was the devil who said, you shall not surely die. God had said, if you eat, you will... Sh well, let's read that. Genesis chapter 2. Go back to chapter 2, verse 17. God speaking to Adam. It says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God said you will surely die. The devil said you will not surely die. Who lied? Notice somebody is disagreeing with God here. And it's that old serpent. God said you will surely die. The devil said no, you will not surely die. Who lied? Think about this. If... The soul is immortal, then the devil did not lie. If you believe the soul is immortal, then you have accepted the lie of the devil that when you die, you don't really die. God said you will surely die. The devil said no. You're not going to surely die. You have an immortal soul, Eve. You can't surely die. Maybe the body will die. This part of you is going to live on. And it's amazing how that lie told by the devil in the bowels of Eden has been accepted by almost every religion of the world. The Babylonians believed in the immortal soul. The Egyptians, that's why they mummified their dead. They believed the soul lived on after death. The Greeks, the Romans also taught the soul was immortal, could not die. Buddhism teaches the soul is immortal. You go from one life form to another, reincarnation. Islam also believes in the immortal soul. Freemasons teach the immortal soul, one of their Ten Commandments. And interestingly enough, Satanists also believe in the pagan doctrine of the immortal soul. And here's what's amazing. There are Christians and even churches who teach and believe that the soul is immortal, you cannot die. Let me give you an example. Some years ago, there was an article that came out in Reader's Digest magazine. You may have heard of Reader's Digest. It's a secular publication. But they had an article entitled, There Is No Death, written by one of America's leading preachers. And in the article, it said this, quote, this is what the preacher said, you don't really die at all. It may seem like death, but you really keep on living and no more afterward than you did before, end of quote. Who else said that? That's what the devil told Eve in Eden. That's what the cults believe. When you die, you're not going to really die. You'll actually know more after you die than you did before you died. That's what a preacher said. That teaching lays the foundation for spiritism, spiritualism. Here is a statement from a spiritist who said, quote, Spiritualism says that the dead know more than the living. What's the Bible say? The Bible says, read with me. Here it is from Ecclesiastes 9.5. Read with me. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. So this spiritist says, spiritualism says, the dead know more than the living. That's contradicting the Bible. Reading on, he says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Genesis 3, verse 4. So the spiritist is quoting from the Bible. Continuing, he says, In this, as in many of the Bible passages, the devil told the truth, and the Lord is in error. 
That was from E.W. Sprague, a spiritist. Spiritism says the devil told the truth, God lied. The Bible says the devil is the father of lies and God cannot lie. Spiritism says the devil is good, God is bad. The Bible says that God is love and the devil is our enemy. Spiritism says the dead know more than the living. The Bible says the dead don't know anything. And we have to choose who to believe. God's word or spiritism. Spiritism or spiritualism, according to the dictionary, is the belief or doctrine that the spirits of the dead communicate with the living, especially through mediums. This is the devil's door. As we are discovering tonight, let me show you some of the things associated with spiritism. New Age, reincarnation, extrasensory perception, magic, occultism, astrology, witchcraft, Satanism. That's all associated with spiritism. And I'm going to add another one tonight, and that is Harry Potter. That is also associated with spiritism, the occult. You live on after death. You'll find that, of course, from Harry Potter. Modern spiritualism had its origin in the Hydesville Cottage in Hydesville, New York. This is a replica of that original cottage. It was a haunted house. And in the mid-1800s, when the Fox family moved into this haunted house, they were at first terrified by the ghosts living in the house. They would hear these ghosts knocking on the windows. They would knock on the walls. They would knock on the doors. They, would, they could hear them running up and down the hall. They would run up and down the stairs. Scared the Fox family. But the family, they didn't move out. They continued living there in that haunted house with these ghosts. And they got used to living. They put carpet on the stairs to cut down on the noise of the ghosts running up and down the stairs. The Fox sisters, they started trying to communicate with the ghosts. And one day when they heard the rappings, they heard the ghosts knocking, the spirits knocking on the wall or the window or something, one of the Fox sisters called back to the spirits. And she said, snapped her fingers a few times, she said, do what I do. And back came a volley of rappings. And it wasn't long before they had set up a, a system of, of tapping out messages, rapping out messages back and forth. And the very first message that those ghosts rapped out, tapped out to the Fox sisters, summarizes spiritualism in all of its forms. Would you like to know the message? Here it is. We are all your dead relatives and friends. The Fox sisters opened the devil's door. Who was it there in that haunted house? The Bible tells us who it was. Revelation 16, 14, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. That haunted house was inhabited by demons claiming to be the spirits of their relatives and friends, they set up a marker stone at the site of the Hydesville Cottage. Here's a picture of it. It says, The birthplace of modern spiritualism. Upon this site stood the Hydesville Cottage, the home of the Fox Sisters, through whose mediumship communication with the spirit world was established, March 31, 1848. Notice the large letters at the bottom. There is no dead or death, rather. There is no death. There are no dead. Who else said that? That's what the devil said in Eden. You shall not surely die. That's what the cults believed. It was from that day that spiritualism began to spread. Within five years, the devil's door had been thrown wide open. There were 30,000 spiritualistic mediums in America alone conversing with the spirits. After 1848, there are two fundamental teachings of spiritism. I want to mark them here for you. Number one, spiritism claims that the dead are not dead. Here's a statement from a book on spiritism. It says, the fundamental principle of spiritism is that human beings survive bodily death. And that occasionally, under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who've gone before. That's from the book 
Spiritism, History, Phenomena, and Doctrine, page 25. So number one, Spiritism teaches that the dead aren't dead. You don't really die. Second, fundamental teaching of Spiritism, Spiritism claims that the dead communicate with the living. Here is a statement from a Spiritist who said, There is no death in the graveyard. I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that people live after death, for I f frequently talk with them. That's from Sir Oliver Lodge. The Bible says, what's the Bible say? Read with me. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Since the dead don't know anything, how can they communicate with us? Sir Oliver Lodge may not realize it. He doesn't realize it, but he is conversing with who? Not the spirits of the dead. He's conversing with demons. Revelation 16, 14, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Sir Oliver Lodge doesn't know he's talking with demons. Eve didn't know she was talking to the devil either back in Eden. You say, well, pastor, what about the story of the spirit that came up when Saul went and met with the witch of Ender? You can read that story, by the way, in 1 Samuel 28. And as you read the story, I'll just give you some of the background. As you read the story, Saul, the first king of Israel, was facing an enemy army. Saul was living in disobedience to God. And so when Saul went to God for guidance concerning the battle, God would not answer Saul. And finally, Saul got so angry with God, he said, well, if God's not going to talk to me, I'll go to the other source. He went to the witch of Ender. Do witches work for God? Yes or no? Who do they work for? They work for the devil. So one thing we know from 1 Samuel 28, God was not talking to Saul. We know that Samuel was God's prophet. Since God was not talking to Saul, wouldn't talk with, to Saul with, through any medium, any communication, then we know that it was not God or Samuel that talked to Saul there. There's an interesting commentary on this story from a book entitled Patriarchs and Prophets, page 679, says this. It was not God's holy prophet that came forth at the spell of a sorcerer's incantation. Samuel was not present in that haunt of evil spirits. That supernatural appearance was produced solely by the power of Satan. And he could as easily assume the form of Samuel as he could assume that of an angel of light when he tempted Christ in the wilderness. That was not Samuel that came forth. And you may remember, if you've ever read the story, this spirit told Saul, tomorrow you'll be with me. Those people who say that Samuel is in heaven, this text doesn't help them at all, because if so, then Saul would go to heaven the next day when he died. The Bible makes it very clear Saul is going to be lost, because he, did, he rebelled against God. So we know this is a story of a spirit that came forth claiming to be Samuel. It's a Bible example of how a demon can masquerade as Samuel. It wasn't Samuel that came forth at the call of that witch. God forbid his people from communicating with the spirits of the dead. I want to read that, that warning. From Deuteronomy chapter 18. This is the fifth book of your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to read verses 10 through 12. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. These were the instructions God gave his people back then. God says, There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter to pass through the fire. That's when they used to sacrifice their children to the idols. They would burn their children as sacrifices to those pagan idols, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, there you can see the astrologer, or an enchanter, or a witch, that would be Harry Potter, <laughs> or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, that's one who talks with the dead, or a wizard, or a necromancer. A necromancer is another person who communicates with the dead. Verse 12. For all that do these, these things are an, a what? an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. 
God dr drove away those pagan nations because they were offering their children to idols. They were communicating with the spirits of the dead. And God warned his people, do not communicate with the spirits of the dead. Why would God not want us to talk with the dead if they're living on? Because God knows that's not our loved ones living on. He knows that if we talk to the dead, we're opening what? We're opening the devil's door. The Bible says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, and God does not want us to talk with demons. Even those who are masquerading as our loved ones. The Bible says, read with me, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. There's another question we want to answer tonight. And that's the question, when do we receive immortality? Do we receive immortality when we die? Or do we receive it when Jesus comes back? Let's read the answer from the Bible. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. You can put that in your notes. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, referring to death. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to be in the grave, that is. But we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. When's the last trump sound? That's when Jesus comes back. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we, that's we that are living, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When do we put on immortality? When Jesus comes back. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? We receive immortality when Jesus comes back. There's another question I want to address tonight. And that is regarding angels. Angels are not the spirits of our departed loved ones. There are some people that think, well, when you die, you, go and be, you become an angel. Here's the question. Do angels ever appear to human beings? What's the answer? Yes, they do. Here's another question. Do they ever appear as one of our departed loved ones? The answer is no. Which brings us to the question, how do they appear? How do angels, or good angels I should say, how do they appear? One of two ways. You can mark this. They appear either as an angel or as a stranger. If it's an angel from heaven, they're going to appear either as an angel or as a stranger that you don't know. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. If an angel appears as one of our dead loved ones, what kind of angel is that? That's what we call a fallen angel or a demon. The Bible must be our guide, and if we don't follow God's word, I had a lady one time, she told me, she said, Pastor, she says, she said, I had two grandsons. I loved them dearly, and they used to come over, and they would visit Grandma, and they were little boys, and they liked to run around, so she said sometimes they would knock things over. She says, my grandsons were killed in a car accident. She said, Pastor, I know what the Bible says, but she says, my grandsons have been coming back to visit me. Grandma, she says, I, I can't see them, but I hear them. They come in, and I can hear their voices, and they run around in my house. They're, they're spirits, and they knock things over just like they used to. She says, I know what the Bible says, but I still choose to believe that that's my grands, grandsons coming back to visit Grandma. We can believe whatever we want to believe. But if we want to be anchored against the devil's deceptions, we must believe the word of God. That's the only defense. What is the devil's door? You probably guessed it by now. The devil's door is communicating with the spirits of the dead. And you can see how that door has been thrown open in many lives. And there have been tragic results to that. This is the devil's door. Somebody once wrote these words. This is from the book Great Controversy. That's 
in the, the Great Hope. We have it for sale here if you'd like that. Quote, many will be confronted by the spirits of devils, personating beloved relatives or friends, and declaring the most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. If my mother were to come back and present herself to me, now that would be quite a sensation. But I know what the Bible says, so I would know that wouldn't be mother at all. Reading on it says, we must be prepared to withstand them. That's these demons that come as our loved ones. We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know how much? The dead know not anything and that they who thus appear are the spirits of devils. Eve, we mentioned, was talking to the devil in Eden and didn't know it. And there are people today that are communicating with demons. And do not realize it. The Bible says, read with me. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. We have learned tonight how to identify a cult. Cults follow a human leader rather than Jesus. Cults follow human teachings rather than the Bible. Cults urge group conformity. And number four, cults are deceived on the state of man and death. And unfortunately, there are multitudes that are also deceived. We have discovered what the Bible teaches about death. Number one, the Bible teaches the dead are asleep. Psalms 13, verse 3, Job 14, verse 12, John 11, 11, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 53 texts at least. The Bible calls death asleep. Number two, the Bible teaches the dead are in the grave. Jesus said so, John 5, 28 and 9. Peter said so, Acts 2, 29 and 34. The Bible also teaches, number three, the dead know not anything. Where's that text? Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6 and 10. And Psalms 146, verse 4. And then number four, the Bible teaches the dead do not return to their homes. Job 7, verses 9 and 10. Job 16, 22. I choose to believe the Bible, don't you? When you believe what God's Word says, what do you do? You sh shut the devil's door. Slam it in his face. Jesus said, what did he say? Read with me. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free from the devil's deception. I want to follow the word of God, don't you? Is it your commitment, your desire to follow the teachings of the Bible? If that's your desire, your commitment, let me see your hand tonight. We're going to end our meeting by singing this song, Does Jesus Care? This is a song for those who have lost a loved one. I lost my mother two years ago. Some of you have lost a loved one even more recently than that. This song is for you. Let's stand together as we sing this hymn, Does Jesus Care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it aught to him does he see? Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are 
weary the long night's dreary, I know my Savior cares. Yes, friend, he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. If you would be so kind, those of you in this area, I'd like you to just to pause for a moment after prayer so I can make it my way out to shake your hand. Let's bow our heads together. Our dear Heavenly Father, again tonight we are so thankful for the Bible and the truths of your word that set us free from the devil's deceptions. We're thankful to know that the dead are resting, sleeping in the grave, we look forward to that day when we'll meet them again. We pray tonight you'd help us to base our faith on your holy word. Shield us, we pray, from the devil's delusions. We ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow night, the mystery of hellfire. See you then. <laughs>